So first of all, thank you for coming. I mean, it's 7.30, um, start of Java 1, typically at this stage of the game, I'm uh, half drunk somewhere, so thank you for coming in and actually paying attention. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, going real time. And this mic's about to fly off, hang on. Let me do that, is that, no, bugger. I'll try again. All right. Um, so the whole point of this talk today is to talk about an emerging uh, trend and technology, uh, which is uh, real-time APIs or streaming APIs. Now, the first time I gave this talk, um, no one had any clue what I was talking about. And it's because I started at the middle and started talking about how to implement them without describing really what they were. So this session, um, I know the boffs are supposed to be very technical, but I'm going to start with some slides and talk through the what and why of, of uh, streaming APIs. And if you're uh, on Twitter, then please tweet the session. Uh, no one believes me that anyone would turn up at 7.30, so thank you very much. Um, a bit about me. So uh, I actually created the, the Mule project, which is an open source integration platform. Quick show of hands who knows Mule. Good showing. And how many people use it? Just a few of you. OK. Damn you all. <laughs> you know it and you're not using it. That's not good. Um, OK, so I also started the, uh, uh, founded the, the MuleSoft uh, company as well. And, and we do um, integration on the cloud and on-premise. I, you know, I won't bore you with that. But essentially, if you need integration, you can come to us. Uh, I started life in banking, actually. I was um, uh, an architect um, for investment banks. I worked at two different major projects. And I really got to see how middleware kind of sucked. Um, and it, hopefully now, thanks to Mule and new other things that happened, it sucks less. But essentially, what I really am is a plumber. All I do, all I think about is, is, is putting plumbing between uh, different applications. I think there's a saying which you can either focus on the, um, the plumbing or the porcelain. The porcelain being the sexy stuff that people get you know, lots of money for. The uh, integration, the plumbing is at the background that no one really cares about, but it's actually horrible and painful. So we try and fix that for you. Now finally, who knows what Marmite is? Quick show of hands. Uh, just a few of you. Do you like The ones who know what it is, do you like it? <laughs> and the ones who don't like it, show of hands. All right, can you please leave? Because we're not going to get on. <laughs> Right, Marmite is one of those things you either love it or hate it, and uh, I'm a massive fan of it. But anyway, we say in the in the UK it's a great way to divide the, a group of people is just by whether you like Marmite or not. Doesn't carry here clearly. Um, so, um, quick agenda: uh, what the heck is real-time APIs? I'm going to talk about the technologies, and then I'm going to give you some demos, and we'll get into some code, and and hopefully by then it will all make sense. Oh, I can't walk very far. Clearly, I'm tethered. All right, so I'm never going to meet you over there. I'm sorry. Um, so what is real time? Well, it's actually just the ability to react to changes as they happen. I mean, life happens in real time. Real time, um, it just means that things happened and you get to know about them. Um, if you've worked in banking, real time actually means low latency, sub nano or millisecond um, uh, message processing. On the web, real time is, is a bit more lenient. It's probably about a second or 900 milliseconds. So that means, the point something happens to the point you know about it, there's a latency there of maybe, you know, up to 900 milliseconds to one second. That would be considered real time on the web. Um, so what is a real time API? Well, it allows you to register interest in things that you care about on an application. So um, you know, some examples of this would be, I want to know when a new customer registers. I want a new, you know, when a new sign up happens. Or you know, when a stock price changes. Or you know, note, it can be a long term thing as well. So you can say, when these three things happen, then let me know. Or in you know, four weeks, tell me about something. That sounds like Google Calendar. But in essence, it also works um, as a selection query on a real time API. So why real time? Um, I mean, basically, you don't make people wait. So it, it's about experience. If you make people wait, and what I mean by that, well, real time tends to be a back end server side technology, but actually, it feeds data to usually front end applications. So on the web, JavaScript sort of grew out of this notion of um, everything happening in callbacks and, and um, with uh, Ajax and uh, long polling and. Um, and uh, the request process on the browsers, and the old ones at least, we had this notion of AJAX where data would come back and forth to the browser without pressing F5. 
Um, the bizarre thing is that happened on the client, but on the server, we're still doing this HTTP request response model. So it's kind of weird. We've sort of done loads and loads on the front end to make um, a, you know, our user interfaces much cleaner and simpler and, and more reactive. And on the server side, we're, we're polling, which is a little bit weird. Um, also, certainly in my world, we think a lot around um, not just people, but actually other applications and other systems and processes and devices and, and all these other things. And they don't like to wait either. So for example, if, uh, if I've got a, a Salesforce CRM application, I have a financial package, if I create a new product or I have a new customer or a new invoice, uh, some of that information needs to be propagated to the back-end system. The reason why you want that to happen in real time is you don't want things getting out of sync. When things get out of sync, um, essentially uh, you have to then start doing sort of batch processing. And you, you create this delta of information between what's actually current and what's stale. So consistency is a big key, key part for me when you talk about system to system real time. And I said it before, everything else happens in real time anyway. And, and certainly consumers of our applications, how many build web apps here? Just a quick show of hands. Wow, quite a few of you. Um, you know that your, your users and, and certainly the employees that use your applications are looking for more real-time experience, right? They, they actually want things to happen in real time. They don't want to have stale information. They want as much information as possible. This means that real time is going to become more and more important part of your everyday lives because the applications you connect to or the REST APIs that get published, um, if they're not real time, there's always going to be a certain amount of delay. And it, not for every application. Some applications are fine. But on the whole, we'll, we'll see a trend, and I'll talk a bit about this in a minute, um, where people will offer both a REST API and a streaming API so you can get the best of both worlds. And by the way, it's, it's a good-sized group, but if you just want to ask questions in between, I feel like birds of a feather, we should you know, flock together, sorry. We should be able to ask questions. Um, so just raise your hand, and, and I'll repeat it to the group. OK, so why real time? Well, I just spoke to some of the advantages, one of them being speed. Just knowing about something when it happens in real time is better than knowing about it four or five seconds later. So as an example, um, what do we, on APIs, let's talk about REST APIs first. What do we do on consumers? Well, we poll. Um, polling doesn't seem inherently evil, actually it isn't. Um, but you are making a request to an API, say every 60 seconds, uh, probably at the quickest for most APIs. Um, the thing with that is about 62.371% of those requests yield no result. That's an exact figure. I have that number at hand. So. Um, there, some people are paying attention, that's good. Um, so the problem is, is, one is I'm making a lot of calls without getting any data back. There is actually quite a high number of, of polling requests that happen. So I, I use Salesforce as an example because I know their platform team. They work on their, their API and especially their streaming API um, in the same way they build their product. It's a massive part of what they do. They have over 50% of their customers who use their API and don't use the front end technology. And um, with them, they have so many people pinging their API at any given time that it, make, it creates a massive load on, the, on their own data centers. And you can just imagine if you've got millions of requests coming in, the stuff you have to do there to, to serve that, only to serve nothing back. It's kind of pointless. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, uh, you're talking about real-time API and kind of the immediate nature. Uh, the title of this block is also like a streaming API. When I think of streaming, I think of like, you know, Yep. Is that kind of part of this as well? Yes, it is. You are, yes, sir, you're in the right talk. So the question quickly was, um, are we also going to be talking about streaming as well as real time? I actually use real time as the umbrella for streaming and push. So I'm going to separate those two in a minute as well. So way ahead of me there. Um, so yeah, just with Salesforce, the, um, so their API yields a lot of known results. The other challenge with polling, if, if it's three minutes or every hour, is there might be new updates like half a millisecond after you polled, and now you, you've got an out-of-date system. That really matters in some areas, it doesn't matter in others, but on the whole, you don't want that gap to be too large to where two systems have different sets of data, especially when there's many consumers hitting it. And the other thing you have to hit is actually boundaries on the APIs themselves. So if you're using open APIs uh, from Salesforce as an example, um, then uh, you're going to hit a, uh, rating limits. So there's only so many times I can hit the Salesforce API until they shut it down and ask me to pay more so I can hit it more frequently. 
So actually, if 6% of your calls are not returning any result and you hit your threshold limits, then you're really getting 40% value of the API. So it doesn't make sense. The other thing is the broadcast. Um, generally, broadcasting means that when an event happens, when you go to streaming, you actually think of the world in terms of events. Something happened that somebody's interested in, I'm going to let them know. <clears throat> the great thing about that is when you're actually building the APIs that allows you to do lots of optimizations on the server side, which we won't really get into today, but they're there. Um, but on the consumer side, it also means you can have lots of things happen at once because an event happened. So event-driven programming generally as a, as a discipline is, is pretty interesting because it sort of mimics the way things happen in the world anyway. Like something happens, something else happens, and you tell people about it. So real-time allows you to do this because you have multiple subscribers subscribing to topics that they, they care about. <clears throat> and finally, engagement. Because things react more quickly and you have more control over the events as they happen, you can provide more interesting um, engagement of your applications. That, that speed of efficiency of just getting the data when you expect it and the fact that things don't get out of sync um, or you know, very close to sync means that your application will run better and your users will be happier. So push versus streaming. You, sir, especially for you. Um, so there's two types of technologies I'm talking about really here. One is uh, push technologies, which is more you register a hook with something to sort of say, let me know when something changes, um, and it will, it will send you a message. And the other one is streaming, whereby you open up a socket directly to the server, and new events come down the pipe as they're received. They're a bit different because one is, uh, one is connected, one is actually disconnected. Push is disconnected. You're not waiting on something to come back. It's not long polling. If you, how many people know Ajax here? Or well, maybe I should say Comet D, really. Comet D. Quite a, yeah, a few of you. So Comet D sort of uses long polling, uh, or used to. Maybe it's changed with the web, uh, web sockets approach. Um, but the difference is, you know, one is we'll call you back. The other one, you keep the line open, and it's a bit more request response. So streaming. Um, sort, of, sort of mimics what we do anyway when we do socket-based programming, essentially. Um, they both have drawbacks. Um, the one with push that people seem to forget, so if you know webhooks as an example of a push technology, is you have to set up a re reply channel. I mean, you have to set a, sorry, a, um, uh, a push channel. And that means that for a lot of people, you've got to open up a new socket on your firewall to receive incoming data. Folks don't like doing that, especially in, in the IT and, and the security side. Um, and there's not a lot of uh, reliability there, just because when something gets pushed, it's then going over the internet and it should be received by you, but there's not a lot of recourse. There's no acknowledgement mechanism in webhooks, as an example, uh, by default. It, it's just an ideal rather than a complete framework. So there's some real challenges there just on uh, reliability. Um, and then streaming APIs, you do have a socket connection open. We do find ways of doing that. But actually, if you build a streaming API, um, there's a real challenge there on how do you manage your uh, load balancer, as an example. Because at some point, if you, you have over, um, you know, uh, that, well, what is it, 36,000 or 64,000 um, connections, then somehow you need to be able to load balance those over to a different subnet. So in terms of just architectural complexity, um, streaming APIs can be troublesome when you have many, many clients. Um, and durable collections are a little bit more difficult. Um, not impossible, but they're not that easy either. So REST or real time? This is one of the first questions I got my last time I did this. Because a lot of people build REST APIs, and I'm talking about real time or streaming APIs. and um, I don't think people realize that they're actually different, but they are. So you're not going to take sort of a JAX RS implementation and, and add a sort of a streaming annotation to it, as an example. Um, you actually implement a, a different technology stack, stack for streaming APIs than you do for REST APIs. So the, one of the weird things about this is it does actually fragment your beautifully elegant RESTful API because now you've got two ways of accessing it. But the benefits, so that also means you have two different clients. So bear that in mind for usability as well. Uh, typically, uh, streaming APIs are for reading data. So 
the whole idea is, is I want to read something, so tell me about it when it changes or something new happens. But it's not typically used the same model for updating or publishing new information. There's just not a lot of uh, return and value in, in, in sending things over AJAX versus just making a simple REST call. So if you're using JavaScript programming, you, you really know all this stuff. So, I mean, this is kind of what a REST API looks in in a very basic form. Uh, so you have a database in the back end, you have a number of resources, and your consumers connect through the REST API. When you add streaming, it's a secondary box. And it's this secondary box that we'll talk a bit more now about. So the first of all, you have, you have a front-end technology here, and I'll talk about the technologies in a minute, but typically it's, it's things like um, Comet-D or uh, uh, some sort of just socket connection, or there's other sort of push technologies like PubSub, Hubbub, and, and a few others. Then, typically, what makes it streaming is also there will be some sort of subscription manager, whether that's uh, topic subscription or is actually query uh, queries um, from the end user. There's some way. There's some way there. You need to manage um, the identifier that says this is what I'm interested in. So it's a bit different from a REST API because. There's never this, just this one thing that people are interested in. They just make calls to resources. Now I'm registering interest in something. It becomes a subscription. So again, if you're familiar with event-driven um, versus request-response programming, this is request-response. This is far more event-driven. And as such, the semantics change quite drastically. And then quite often, um, with subscription, there's also query. So what do I mean by that? If you think about Salesforce um, or Facebook or uh, Twitter or a number of these other guys that have, have streaming APIs, one of the things they have is you register for interest by passing in a query. So if you're familiar with Salesforce, they have this thing called Salesforce Object Query Language, and you define which objects you're interested in. You make that a topic that you want to subscribe to, and then it'll give you updates. It's quite elegant, actually. It's a, it's a nice way of, it's just, it's like having a database that calls you back, which is, is pretty neat. Um, but the challenge of building one is if you don't naturally have a query semantic inside your application, like you don't have a filtering language or something, then the query mechanism either has to be built or you have to leverage something. And uh, there's not many technologies. Yes? OK. Yes. Yes, exactly. Did everyone hear that? So uh, he said it better than I did. So I'm going to just take off the mic now and hand over to this guy. Um, no, so the roles of these two is the discussion manager controls um, um, who gets the events, so it ties events to interest, and the query processor actually filters the events that, that the you know that the um, uh, subscriptee is is interested in. Essentially, make sense? Clear as mud. All right, thank you. So there's a few different um, there's a few different technologies here at play. So um, on the on the real time side, on the transport side at least, uh, there's things like Comet and Comet D, which is the, the implementation in Java. Um, Web sockets, you've all have heard of those and, and know what they are. Um, they're not the same. If you if you know both, you know why. But you know, Comet D actually has subscription built in. It's like a published surprise engine. It's not just opening sockets back and forth to the server. Um, there's also some defined protocols. So uh, there's things like XMPP, which is that uh, the chat protocol that was always destined. You know, they thought there was going to be destined to be you know real time messaging on the web. Turns out it's horribly painful. Um, the clients are quite heavy. And whenever I see XMPP, I back away slowly. Um, Bayer is actually the protocol behind Comet. So that's actually the handshake. When you get the messages saying subscribed, unsubscribed, that's the Bayer protocol. And also ActiveMQ have a similar thing called Stomp. Uh, that is a wire level protocol for doing um, uh, also cross-language um, uh, uh, subscriptions. And a lot of people actually invent their own. So because this is very new, um, a, lot of, a lot of APIs have actually invented their own ways of doing this. And it's kind of valid to do that right now because there's no, you don't get much support out of the box. for you know, uh, So Twitter, for example, I think is pretty ad hoc in the way it does things. Facebook uh, uses PubSub Hubbub, but a, a kind of a subset of it, and they've really bastardized it to make it work for their environments. 
Um, and then on the push side, the, the two main ones are you know, PubSub Hubbub, which is this project from Google um, that basically implements a handshake and a uh, publish subscribe engine on top of HTTP. And Webhooks is, well, Webhooks. It's been around for a long time, I'm pretty sure. Everyone, is everyone familiar with Webhooks? Roughly, oh, no one is, okay. Uh, so Webhooks is actually um, just a definition of, of how to exchange information um, over the web using this notion of uh, re registering interest and then also a callback URL that will get called back and people have built that into their platforms. It's pretty basic but um, it was the first sort of push that really took on in the web. Okay, so they're here. I've just given you some examples, but um, the rest, of, you know, some of the guys that already have streaming APIs, Salesforce uses Comet D, um, Facebook uses PubSub Hub, Hub with a asterisk because uh, they sort of messed around with it a bit. Um, Instagram also had their own uh, callback mechanism, uh, which is also sort of built based on the ideas of webhooks and PubSub Hub. Hub. So no one's, the only one vanilla here actually is Superfeeder, which uses XMPP and, and uh, Salesforce. Um, you know, PubNub is interesting because I've actually had, uh, people familiar with PubNub? It's, uh, it's like a, a WebSocket based messaging system on, on, on the web. It has basically a very simple API. And uh, what a lot of folks are looking at it for is, is using it as the implementation for their own streaming API sometimes. And the reason being is because it's just be like a very simple publish subscribe service as you get from Amazon, um, but it's just called PubNub and it's very, very fast. And they've done some very cool stuff, making it low latency by using CDNs to deliver your messages and things like that, so it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, th th this is a very small list of stuff you may or may not have heard of, uh, but on essence, I think uh, the number of streaming APIs out there today are very small. So 1%, according to programmable web, uh, of APIs have a streaming interface. So it's still very new. So um, the reason I'm talking about this is because I've sort of been an advocate of real-time since I built Mule uh, a long time ago, and, and real-time's been fairly common in the enterprise. Um, it's not so common on the web, and I think it's got to get there. If, if you think about the levels of engagement that users are going to want, the types of information and the way they want to interact with other systems, real-time is probably the only way that we can really do it really well. Um, so I still talk about real-time. The other interesting thing here is, um, on, actually this is just charter protocols, so pretty much um, uh, most streaming APIs are tied to REST-based APIs, um, and REST-based APIs are taking over SOAP-based APIs generally, so newer APIs essentially are also adopting streaming APIs. And the data formats used, it's pretty even split between uh, JSON and XML. So. Um, depending on your flavor. I still prefer JSON over XML, but there's reasons to have both, I guess. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna dig into some code. Um, so the examples I'm gonna use, I'm doing a mule because I think they're readable and we can, I can probably communicate a lot through that expressive language that you've all looked at but not using. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there, so give me a second. No, I have to actually stop the presentation a second. Okay, I'm going to show you two examples. The first one, um, uh, the first one is actually uh, AJAX based, so it's a really simple pub sub with AJAX, just so you can see um, really the notion of the uh, subscription engine in play, which is essentially a client would register interest on a topic and then get published updates on it. Um, there's a few bits of this demo. Uh, first, what we're looking at here is, is the, the Mule XML. If you're not familiar with Mule, it has an XML DSL-like language, um, which defines uh, integration flows that describe how to interact with a system. It doesn't say uh, what you should actually, it just says what you should do, it doesn't say how you should do it. So, just, so for example, um, here, uh, well let's start at the top here. This embeds a JMS uh, broker, ActiveMQ, in this instance. So, you know, here you might connect to a remote one or, or a local. This, this will just embed it inside Mule, essentially. 
Um, we create two different HTTP servers uh, just because we're using client and server in the same file. Um, this actually creates AJAX layer on top of the HTTP server one. Um, just as a matter of course, that's just what it does. So by putting this in my, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Tomcat Web XML, this is kind of like binding your servlets to, to code. The difference is, is in Mule, it's a very much more sort of fun functional based language. So what happens is a flow has a trigger and then everything that happens executes inside the, the context of that flow and you move through, through the uh, steps um, as each task gets executed. So, so far we've created our HTTP servers and we've created an AJAX server on top of one of them. Um, I'm gonna just jump down to the bottom because I'm also doing something else on these two here. That's just generating um, some dummy data. So every three seconds it'll, cre it'll create a new event and it'll post it onto a JMSQ as an example. So every three seconds, some payload score will pop out and it'll get put onto the public football scores uh, queue. Uh, we do the same thing here um, for um, just demonstration purposes. I just wanna, I wanted to generate new different types of data to show that in actual fact, um, you know, we're using the queue as a subscription me mechanism for publishing. So the queue name uh, that we really care about is public football scores. And then what this does is it receives these events on a JMS inbound endpoint. That could be coming from a web client, could be coming from anywhere, I just use JMS because it's easy to embed um, as a messaging technology. And then it extracts the target channel by looking at the destination that received the uh, message on and uh, essentially all it really does is look at the queue name, strips off the public and replaces the dot with a slash uh, which would create a channel name that's going to publish AJAX events on. Okay, so there's a lot happening there. It's quite condensed because Mule just does a lot of stuff under the covers. Um, but essentially, it, this is just describing exactly what we want to happen. It doesn't have to say how it happens. Okay, uh, let's have a quick look at the bootstrap for this. Okay, so all I'm doing here, um, I've got an abstract demo at the base. Let me just show you what this looks like so you, you have a full picture. Um, so here we're just embedding Mule and we're loading our configuration file, so nothing major there. Um, that terminates it, that's just the termination hook, and um, then we hit run demo, and this will go into, depending on, uh, oh sorry, let me go back. And on the AJAX demo, in run demo, we override it. And what we do is we set up a, an HTTP client, which you guys might be familiar with. I think this is just the Apache, oh no, it's the Jetty uh, HTTP client. And it creates a long, new, long pole transport. So again, if you're on the browser, this is kind of what the browser would do. It, it, it would create an AJAX uh, request using the, the Comet D libraries on the browser. I'm just doing it on the server side just to, for demo purposes and um, creates a new client, waits for the handshake, so this is part of the by year protocol, waits for a handshake to come through so you can add security and things like that there. And then on the cl uh, client, I have this Ajax channel called football scores, which is pretty similar to our, our uh, JMSQ topic, I mean, it's Q. And I create a new message listener that all it does is just uh, does a system out received on the channel and the message itself. So pretty basic. But when I run this demo, this is just gonna run all in my IDE. I just wanted to run it all in one place, but essentially I can connect multiple clients to that and, and have them all listen. So if I run it, should start up and then, oh, I run the wrong one, hang on. It's the wrong demo. Although they actually look exactly the same when they come out, but the, the, the pretext is different. Let's try that again. <coughs> okay, so essentially, even though I'm generating financial uh, data and football scores, I'm only getting notifications on football scores. But if I change the, um, the AJAX channel to um, let me just go back to the previous config. Financial news. Sorry.
Gonna stop that and run it again. I should basically just get a different set of results. Oh, okay, I didn't change that bit. But essentially, that's probably the most basic streaming API. So you're using Ajax on the server side, and it publishes to every client that connects to financial news gets exactly the same data. So the typical demo people give here is chat rooms. I just couldn't bring myself to do a chat room demo at 8 o'clock on a Monday evening. I apologize. Um, so the other quick demo, and I'll give you, and then I'll wrap up and ask for questions is WebSockets. So this is a bit more interesting because I'm actually now going to introduce a query engine. So um, actually I'll just ask a quick show of hands. Who's familiar with ESPA, the uh, Complex Event Processing Engine? Anyone? A couple of people. All right, so the whole point of ESPA is um, you can send it a stream of, inf uh, of discrete events and it will run queries over every event and then um, will you know, fire off a new event when something happens. The nice thing about it has it has support for things like time windows, um, so I can say, if I get this message five times, you know, hundred times in the next five minutes, let me know about it. So the obvious, you know, use case is is things like uh, brand awareness or um, uh, you you know monitoring network traffic, and you just want to monitor certain specific events that happen over any time. In this instance, I'm not doing anything major with it, but I'm going to show you how easy it is to plug in a query engine, because otherwise you've got to think about building your own. So this is actually a pretty good query engine. So in this example, I'm also going to use WebSockets. So instead of using Ajax, which um, I always find more people are familiar with, um, I'm actually now using um, just a, a normal HTTP inbound endpoint here. And to create a WebSocket on top of that, I just need to put this extra element in here, which creates on that same URL but events, is a WebSocket that the clients can now connect into. So pretty basic. Um, I have this bit of code here that will, when, when I receive um, when I receive an event, I execute this Esper WebSocket update listener. And if we look at that really quickly, it might be a bit of an eyesore, but essentially what it says is when um, this statement, which is just an Esper query, executes, uh, call back on this processor and I just do some stuff with it and, and essentially I uh, create a new message and then write it to the events channel. So that's what that bit of code does. It just creates an event and writes it to the channel when something happens. We go back and um, yeah, if, you, if you're wondering, this bit here, this just allows you to use Spring uh, injection like you would any other. I mean, Mule's built, built on the Spring XML, so if you use Spring, you can do all the stuff you can in Spring, plus you get this other syntax on top. And yet again, we just have this other um, sign up events generator. So this is just creating new um, sign up events, which is just sign up with an ID of fake. And when I listen to that, um, let's have a quick look at the Esper config. So Esper, the way you create um, subscriptions is just by defining what type of events you want, and that can be done by root elements or by XPath queries. And this, this instance, I'm just creating, I want to hear everything that starts with the root element of sign up. But that could be football scores, or it could be financial information, or whatever else. OK, and then all that does is it creates the event, uh, converts it to XML, and then sends it into the Esper engine. So Esper itself is pretty powerful. So uh, just by doing that, it embeds an Esper engine. You can actually add a connector up here. Um, this actually creates the engine inside Mule. So Mule is just a container of containers. And down here, now when I just fire in a, uh, um, an event, I give it a name and I pass in the contents, which is this, by the way, is Mule syntax for the Mule message coming in and the payload of the message. So pretty basic. And I run it the same way. This takes a bit longer because we've got Esper running in the background as well. And every three seconds, I'm going to get the same thing again. The only other thing I'll, I'll just highlight here as well, just so we we see the same thing on both sides, is where is it? Uh, 
Uh, on the client side, the way we do uh, WebSockets is we're using the um, the Eclipse Jetty um, HTTP client with WebSockets. So create a client. This is the um, the endpoint it connects to, and you execute a handler on it essentially. And in there on open. This is what I'm interested in. So this is the important bit. So when I said there was always a query that had to be executed, this is the client saying, select all events from sign up events, right? So just gotta go back and tie that in again very quickly. We fire these events, we call them sign up events, and then the user says, hey, you know what? I wanna, I wanna listen to those. Where, where did it go? And here we are. So, and here you can also do select star from sign up events where time window is this or when the, you know, something in the payload is similar. But this is the query language on top of just the um, subscription processing. And that's pretty much it for the demo. I mean, I guess the takeaways here for you are uh, there are a number of technologies. I will just pitch Mule for one minute. Mule makes it very easy to work with these technologies and we haven't yet really codified um, the, the whole process of creating a, 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 a streaming API, but that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. So a lot of this stuff is still a bit ble bleeding edge and you have to do it all yourself, but very soon we'll start building all this stuff into our platform as well. Okay, so just to wrap up here. So you saw a mule how to create two types of um, two types of APIs, one based on um, Ajax, um, which just was uh, published and subscribed. The other one was actually based on WebSockets and also had a query engine embedded as well. But we actually support a whole bunch of technologies. So depending on whether you're, you're doing Comet D or webhooks, as we just saw, you can build your own pretty easily. We support uh, PubSub Hubbub, and we support these other guys down here. Plus, we also have connectors to other third-party streaming APIs. So our platform is really sort of geared up for connecting to these, these newer technologies as well today. Um, the, the state of the nation of REST APIs, or um, sorry, streaming APIs generally, it's still very early adopter territory. It's really good to know about. Um, it's good to understand what people mean when they say real-time or when they say streaming or they say push because they all get mixed together. Real-time for me is really the umbrella term. Uh, that covers both push and streaming APIs. And remember, push is um, you know register interest and a callback URL when when something happens, and streaming is when you actually open up a socket to the server. Um, there are some limitations to these APIs. There's no discovery protocol. So um, what I showed you there, you saw the client that you had to write. That's kind of the client you've got to write. So um, it's not very easy to generate clients today because there's no way of describing a streaming API in a in a normalized format. So that's something to be you know be aware of. Um, typically, if you distribute a client for your APIs, you can actually build streaming into it, and that's actually probably the preferred way to go, in my opinion. Um, and I would say that there's lots of different methods. So I just showed you two. There's um, there's demos for about another two or three I could have shown you. The challenge is, is you're sort of hampered a bit by your client. If you're on an older browser technology, then you know Comet D works better. If you're on newer browsers, then I would always go WebSockets. Um, PubSub Hubbub is okay for some things. I don't know really about you know the performance. I think that's probably why Facebook sort of forked it the way they did. So. You know, understanding the technology is actually quite important because it helps you make a decision. And if you saw from the early adopter APIs, no one's done it the same yet. So I don't think anyone really knows the best way of doing it. But the fact is, once you offer it, um, your, your application immediately becomes more reactive uh, to in, in, for, for people building real-time applications. And pretty much today, anyone building a web app or a mobile app is building a real-time app. I mean, give you an example. I, uh, I've been using this app on my iPhone called uh, QUP which is like a replacement for your calendar that it starts bringing contextual information. So you have your calendar, but then it'll also show me who created the event with a phone number link on it. It will have uh, the last known email I sent to that person so I can very easily um, ping them on, on the last topic we spoke about. And it has things like I'm running late, so you know I can even click it and just it'll send a message automatically saying I'm running late. Very nice um, app. The reason I'm telling you about this is I've got rid of it because uh, it runs really, really slowly. It, because it, it, it polls everything and it has a lot of information to get, it's almost unbearable. And the time when I need it, I'm usually in the car and I'm running five minutes late, it takes 15 seconds to load up. 
So, you know, it's super important. It's kind of the make or break of your app in a lot of ways that it will actually respond really well. And this is only one aspect of speed, of course. There's also network latency, everything else. But by giving people streaming APIs, you're actually giving them more, you know, more options to provide more engaging applications on your platform, which is kind of what you want. All right, so that's me. Um, thank you. I'm going to take some questions now. Uh, the slides will be on SlideShare uh, in just a minute. I'll upload them before I leave. Um, we've got a blog where we talk about a bunch of this stuff, and we're always hiring. So if you are looking for a job and you're in San Francisco or you want to relocate, then please come and talk to me or Melanie, who's sitting here. All right, thank you very much. Can I have some questions? Oh, OK. Clap and then questions. There we are. Yay! Sorry. And if you ask some good ones, I'll throw you a squeezy mule. All right. I think, actually, the guy just behind you, was, uh, he had his hand up first. <laughs> Of the back end, because you don't close down the channel. If we have like a huge number of clients, are going to consume a lot of resources on the back end. Yeah. So, how do you tackle that? Yeah, so how do you scale the back end? Well, actually, if you're using streaming, that's actually a really hard problem. And it's one of the reasons why Heroku, if you know Heroku, don't have um, Ajax support, or they didn't last time I checked. Because when you've got that many clients working over you know, that virtualized network and potentially millions of um, people connecting, it's actually really hard to manage open sockets. There is a way of doing it. Uh, Salesforce have figured it out, um, their platform team. I can't give you the details, mostly because I don't really know them. I actually do want to sit with them and find out how they did it, because it's a pretty complicated problem. OK, there you go. The back there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, I guess the commentary really was that I, I spoke mostly around uh, open-ended queries, but there's a massive use case here of more traditional applications that request a lot of data, and you just want to deliver some of the results early. The, the nice thing about having a, a streaming API in particular is you've got an open socket, so you can start sending stuff way before uh, you finish you know, executing the whole request, as an example which is kind of the whole point of it for, from the um, Ajax standpoint. Was that, was that your question or, I mean, comment? Um, no, there really isn't. It's just that you're using, it enables you to do that over HTTP, which hasn't really been very easy in the past. All right, thank you. Do you want one of these? I want to hit the guy next to you, sorry. Oh, I almost hit him. <laughs> yes. Um, so who's next? Over here. Okay, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat that. So the question really was, uh, there's obviously a lot of data coming from the server side, but the, the client also uh, needs to be um, at least built in a way that it, it has enough resources to consume the data that's receiving. Um, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, that's what the, like the very small snippets of code for async client um, that Jetty uses. It, it's not really apportioning resources, but it, you need to think about that as part of your application today. So there's no, that's what I mean by there's no standards. There's nothing really on the server side to say this is exactly how you should do it. And on the client side, it, depending on what you choose on the server, it sort of dictates the same client technology that matches the server. So Comet D has a client. Um, there's various clients for WebSockets, obviously, uh, which makes it appealing. Uh, if you're using you know, things like pubs, anything with a protocol, typically they, they define the client as well because the protocol has to be honored on both sides. If there's no protocol, like the ad hoc ones and, and WebSockets, then you can define your own um, client, essentially. Oh, hang on. There you go. <laughs> Just a comment. Um, I didn't see a mention of uh, the new project called Vertex, uh, which is pretty much uh, into this basic, I mean, the entire streaming stuff. 
It's that and GitHub. Uh, have you had any experience along with that thing? I haven't played with it yet, so I can't talk about it. But uh, yes, it is definitely it's interesting. Cool where, I mean, uh, they have a distributed even bus, so it, it, it is distributed. So yeah. when you create a public channel, it becomes difficult to make it distributed, right? So it, it's inbuilt in the framework. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's an interesting technology for sure. It's not really a question, but you get one anyway. There you go. <laughs> so at the back there. Okay. So reliability. Um, I, I did make a comment it was hard to achieve. Um, the reason it's hard to achieve is it's, a, it's very much a one way. So it's a bit of a fire and forget on the server side. And if the client disconnects or, uh, you know, in transit, then it, it's kind of gone. At least with, you know, you have a representational state transfer with REST, right? You, you know that either did happen or it didn't happen. With uh, streaming, you don't necessarily know. So it's actually a really good idea to have um, what our customers have done, and they put a reliability layer on front like a proxy that grabs all the vents that's highly available, and then it, it queues them up in something a bit more reliable, and then, and then consumes them. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter. Uh, there's a lot of apps on the web where that just doesn't matter, uh, and there's plenty that do. And when it does, I always recommend putting something more robust um, in front of it. So using Mule and then feeding them into Redis or something would be you know, a great example, and then just publishing them out of there would be fine. You're going to make me throw over everyone. I hope I don't hit anyone. There you go. Um, over here. What about security? So security um, is, is largely dependent on the technology. Well, it's not really. Actually, you use a lot of HTTP-based security, so you have a lot of the same um, tool at your, your exposure, because under the covers, all these guys use HTTP except for XMPP. Um, so it doesn't really change the model. Um, there's nothing new. So there's not anything new there. Like they haven't introduced any new frameworks around security just because it's streaming. You still, you know, you can still use OAuth for doing the checking and then pass tokens around because it's still HTTP requests. Um, the server can still get those requests and, and handle the, the security the same way. There you go. Oh, there you go. So do you have to worry about like attacks at all? Like, are you more vulnerable? Like uh, with push, you are. So definitely with push, you are more vulnerable because um, you're actually opening up a new socket. It's not over, it can be SSL, but it's not going to be a 443. It's going to be um, uh, something new, which really the security teams don't like generally. And most companies will actually say you can't do that on the, on the web end on the front at DMZ. Um, on streaming, potentially, I mean, there's, there's a lot of documented things out there that, that, that could happen, but uh, the frameworks tend to uh, lean into helping you not make those errors. Um, but there's, there's always some risk. But no more risk than your REST API, actually, on the streaming side. All right. Guys, it's getting further and further. All right. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so it, is the Tomcat or any other application server itself is going to support a WebSocket, or is it just a standard perspective? Yeah, actually, Jetty does, um, and, and Jetty does has probably always been the leader, I think, on the app server side. I think Tomcat's implementation, I don't know how good it is. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I, I haven't heard great things, uh, but I haven't used it, so I couldn't really say it's terrible or, or great. Almost. All right, wow. Well, okay, yes. Uh, do, do I need to have uh, separate ports open for, for, for the streaming API to work? Or it goes to no, a streaming you don't. That's the good thing about it. Because, so yeah. No yeah, the, the, uh, the Bayer protocol is you send a request to the server and it opens up a long polling socket for you. So that's why it's kind of nice because it, it doesn't change the, the web paradigm that we have today, uh, it doesn't create anything new. Um, PubSub Hubbub also can, works on uh, port 80 as well, or 80. Yeah. No, exactly. All the push, all the streaming technologies um, will work on the same port, so even, you know, WebSockets the same. 
Uh, some of the other, the other, some of the push technologies don't. So that's probably the difference there as well. There you go. Thank you. Oh god, I'm running out of mules. Oh, I've got plenty more here now. It's all good. Um, so. Is there a way to determine what the client just disconnected and hasn't been responding? Maybe it just puts a request, and maybe it's dead. Is there a way to identify um, some of the connected devices? Yeah. So typically, on the client side, there isn't a whole lot. That's one of the challenges. So you'll notice anyone who, who publicizes a Comet D API will actually have a very rigorous sort of session timeout variables. It will sort of say, this is when the server will give up on you. Um, and that's the way you manage it. And, and actually, I think that's fine because you always have that problem with you know, misbehaving clients don't always do what they're supposed to do. So having terminating things on the server is definitely a best practice, giving it a time window. So it's going to be uh, timing out. Yeah, it times out, yeah. I mean, you, you can be nice and actually send a message saying you're timing out because that allows clients to reconnect. And that's what actually what Bayer does. But it, do, it does not know that you got there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the, the client might not be there. So WebSockets don't do it? Well, WebSockets is just the, the transport. Yeah. There's no protocol on top, yeah. So Sprout Core or any one of the other eventing engines on top of WebSockets do, do, do provide that. There you go. Grab a few more of these. There you are, thank you. Um, so, in terms of streaming, when the socket is kept open, thinking about it, uh, a simple API could be in which the server um, sends directly rights to the stream whenever the chunks are available, and you put a chunk header or something in it, and then the chunk body. And yep. That could be as simple as that you keep this connection open. Yeah, exactly. And it parses the stream asynchronously. Yep. Well, the, the good thing about comment, uh, I don't know if you heard that question on that side, but um, you know, the simplest streaming API could be just chunking data to clients that connect um, over a, a long polling connection, or even, frankly, TCP, right? Um, the, uh, the, what Comet D adds, adds on top is a protocol. So the protocol is a thing that sort of says, here's my hand, it, it introduces a discrete set of steps for handshake, uh, connect, and disconnect and also for meta, so it has this thing around meta that you can extend the protocol to do other things. So having a protocol on the front just means that, um, one, you, you have a discrete set of events where you can plug stuff in so it's not completely wild west, and two, other Comet clients can also access it, so whether you're on JavaScript or Ruby or anywhere else, the, the access is exactly the same. But some people have, you know, just do that the TCP route, and that's fine as well. There you go. Uh, just Jen here. You talk about a few different technologies, and I mean, obviously, um, is there, I mean, these are all emerging things, is there any sort of resources, I'm just, I'm just on the horizon, I need to do kind of a real-time thing, mm -hmm. is there any kind of resource that compares to different features and capabilities of those? Um, no, actually, <laughs> no. Myself, no, and it's pretty painful even finding information out, out there. Well, I found that. Yeah. <laughs> There's not, like, this presentation would have been easier had someone had done that. <laughs> I would have started with that and probably ended with it. Um, but no, it hasn't happened because it's a bit like certainly comparing apples and oranges. I, I suppose you could define your categories and maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it. Because now I've done the work, so I may as well um, share it. Um, if you have particular exact, you know, things you want categorized, be free to, you know, email me on those and I can, I can do that. There you go. Oh, actually, uh, you and then you. Yes. If we're talking about getting the application going real time, uh, what we must do if we want to make the emergency application, the current application that we have now, go real time, we, we must think about the depend on uh, what kind of front end that we're using. Let, let's take example if we use GWD. Yeah. It's only, it's only support now uh, RPC. Uh, protocol. Is there any suggestion for me if we want to? Uh, yeah, if you're using um, an older technology that doesn't support it, it, well, first I start on the server side and I think, you know, I've, maybe I've got an existing application. What do I? What needs to be real time here? And typically, it's some some aspect that you people are interested in. Whether you like some APIs really have filters, for example. So you could see making uh, Flickr. 
uh, adding a streaming API element to it because it really has a very strong filtering mechanism. So you just codify that by, in, into something a, a bit more usable, or maybe you can just leave it as it is. But you allow people to say, and when it updates, let me know about it, right? So that's on the server side. Once you've got that on the client side, the API changes anyway. I mean, there's, there's, there's not many frameworks out there really that have this baked in yet. Um, we, we're we sort of doing it ad hoc at the moment ourselves. We'll, we're actually pretty going to bake it in with one of the existing, or a couple of the existing um, uh, front end uh, technologies. But there's nothing, there's no great answer there for that yet. You, you, you really have to sort of stick it together yourself a bit at first. Yeah. But I mean, for example, if you use an Ajax streaming API, then jQuery already has it built in, and you just use jQuery. I mean, um, with DWR, I'm not so sure whether they have that, but you can use the two together on one page as well. You're loading more libraries, of course, but um, you can do it. There you go. Got three more. All right, so three more questions, and then, then we'll head out. Oh, I looked at that long and hard. I was hoping someone would do it, and uh, it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So I, I looked at it. Uh, this socket I/O is a um, a framework that was built. I, I I looked at it a long time ago. It didn't. It doesn't have a Java uh, implementation, and no one's done it. I think if I had spare time on my hands, I probably would have done it myself. Um, but yeah, I don't really might write much code anymore, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd love to see it, because we'd support it in a heartbeat as well in, in Mule, because I think it was a pretty good implementation. It's interesting that the, the national project is the Java. Who's doing that? Oracle. Oh, Oracle. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I did not know that. Thank you. Anyway, you should get two meals for that, really. Did you say you're hiring? All right. Oh, okay. Um, Java works with Swing. Mule works with Swing. You would eventually work with that Java effects, which I don't know what's involved in doing that, but it's based on Java. So, um, you know, under the covers, you either use a JSR language or uh, is Flex uh, a J JSR language? What? FX? Java. Is that a. It, I don't know anything about FX. I, I should know, but like, it's never, never went that direction. It's to replace, yeah. Oh, okay. It's a replacement of Swing, basically. Oh. Does it. I mean, wouldn't it just work or not? Is it different than Java? No, it is, it Java. is Java. It's part of Java, just uh, additional API. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you just in, embed the same clients as in Java as you would normally. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you guys battle out. I, I think I don't. Front end technologies for me is just like, oh my god. You know, I just know what a good app looks like. I can't build it. I can do the back end for you. But uh, you should. I mean, if it's Java, it should work. Good catch. All right, one last question. Anyone? Uh, on hey, well, you already got one. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. It's all right. You can go ahead. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. On one of the slides, uh, you show the stream API. There's three components to it. Um, the query processor, the subscription manager, and the front end. So the subscription manager is up the bank queue, kind of. That, that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that metaphor. And, and the queue processing is the asset. So what was the new? Yeah, so Mule in, in the second example, because a good question actually, you know, um, I showed that uh, we're using WebSockets and um, JMS as a sort of queue manager and then Esper as the query manager. The thing that Mule provided there was, um, in that real basic example, was just the app server. But the difference is, is at every point where you saw those components, you can start plugging more stuff in, so you can do more interesting stuff. So, for example, uh, when I receive certain events, 
I may want to kick off events in other systems, whether it be Salesforce or you know, to another custom backend system. I can just plug that in really easily. So the, the example was basic, but in reality, what you want to do is more stuff on the server side. When things happen, tell all these other things about it and, and you know, give me some results back. I need to store that somewhere else. I might need to enrich the data that I get. Mule makes it really easy to sort of work with message-based technologies and, and pull in lots of different sources of data and then create new events out of them. Yeah. You want the last one? Sure. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you uh, coming so late on a Monday night. <laughs>